we've got some pretty seismic eruptions going on in the hotel scene and we've got some seismic experts to tell you all how hotel investors and asset managers are viewing all this disruption. Now, unfortunately, one of my guests, uh, Milan Arangelovic, who is the CEO of Around Town Hotels Division, can't be with us. I think he's stuck somewhere between Amsterdam and Berlin. As soon as the lockdown was lifted, he got on his travels. So uh, instead, let's say hello to my first guest, who I think is stuck in Surrey, south of London, the managing director and global head of hotel asset management at Starwood Capital, Cody Brown. Hi, Cody. Good to see you. Um, you could have chosen anywhere in the world to hunker down. Why Surrey? Uh, well, uh, I'm back in London now, but uh, back in London. The, the answer is simple. I have too many kids. And, um, okay, so you're one of the very few people who taken the prime minister at his word and done it a bit earlier than uh, when I left, I left before all the headlines warned of these Londoners invading the countryside. So um, <laughs> I'm going to ask you how home working was with four children running around between the ages of five and 12. But no, you've just told us uh, that you had to escape pretty quickly. There we are. Uh, next, someone who also knows his way around a hotel asset and direct hotel management, the founding partner of Hamilton Partners, uh, Frank Croston. I think Frank is on his way in. I saw him backstage too. There's a big bottle of brandy backstage. The problem in getting these guys in is very difficult. Um, I know Frank's only uh, hunkered down somewhere in Essex uh, near Stansted Airport. Maybe he took an early flight. Have we got Frank? Well, it looks like it's going to be you and I, Cody, to, to talk this one through. But your honors is ready. Yeah. Well, let's let's while we're waiting for Frank, let's see if my third uh, guest is here. Uh, his place is open for business, and that's Sweden. And so, uh, joining us is the CEO of leading European hotel property uh, company, Pandox, Anders. Okay, while we're waiting for Frank and for Anders, uh, Cody, let's have a quick snip, snapshot of what's happening in the uh, in Starwood's uh, backyard. Wait a minute, we've got Anders coming in. Well, good now. Hi, Anders. Man. Is the policy in Sweden working with COVID-19? You're open for business? Yeah, well, partly open. Um, you know, the strategy in Sweden is simple, that we believe that to get this out, we need everybody to be infected, and so we yeah. we have we have more we have a social distance, and we have organized our society in a new way. But we are not closing down because we don't think right. that's the right way of doing it. So it works so well, quite well. But fortunately, with the policy of wanting to infect us all, you can't do that online. So. Uh, both Cody and I are, are rather unscathed at the present time. We're still waiting for Frank to make a dramatic... Uh, let's get a quick snapshot of the current situation in both of your businesses. Uh, Cody, your hotels in the States and in Asia must be back up and running, looking good? Yeah, they're starting to reopen. The hotels in China uh, reopened uh, in sort of early to mid-April. Uh, I know China was banking on the first week of May being sort of the public holidays for being the, the point at which the government would <clears throat> reopen uh, certain uh, components of the economy for business, including hotels. Uh, and so that was a, a nice preview of what's hopefully to come. The U.S. has kind of taken the challenge with the U.S. is you've got 50 different states doing 20 different things and the federal government claiming to be in charge. Uh, and so it's a bit uh, disjointed in their approach, uh, but at least the rest of us may learn some lessons for what works and what doesn't work as each okay. state, state takes kind of a, a different approach ranging from the Swedish approach to, to perhaps the, the, the UK approach. Yeah. Um, so Anders, give us a snapshot of your portfolio. Open in Sweden, what's the occupancy like in Sweden? Well, occupancy is like rest of Europe, something between uh, 10 to 20 percent, maybe even lower yeah. some days. Um, but one of the keywords we have in we have in Pandox here has to be in stay alive. That means that we have not closed our hotels, our 55 hotels. If the 
government hasn't closed it. So we have tried to stay open. Uh, and right. and as all we know, who is in this business, a quite limited cost between having an hotel open with limited service or having just closed. Because if you have a large hotel, you always need to manage them. So we have them open, all of them or most of them still, but a very low occupancy across the portfolio. So our, our income today is basically coming from minimum rents, um, which is basically more or less the level of um, the cost we have in Pandox. So we are in a good position because we have yeah. a no burn rate or very low burn rate. And we have uh, 4.3 billion Swedish on the credit card lines. That, so we will survive for a very long time. Good. So at the circumstances, it's okay. Owning the real estate at the moment is a real built-in advantage if you can look for advantages in this uh, dire situation. Um, yeah. I mean, we've heard a lot in the last decade about going asset light, but in a situation like this, owning the real estate gives you some protection. Yeah, as asset light means that you also leave the sector and you only be specialist in terms of revenues and fees. And I would call that a big risk whatever right. sort of uh, business cycle you're into. Right. I think that is what I, I know. know. Chris, I know you're based in uh, Essex near Stansted. Of course, you can now get out of the house and uh, see the wonderful green pastures in the Essex countryside. Uh, just before the pandemic took hold, you completed a merger with Boston-based Pyramid Hotel Group, creating a 141 hotels across eight eight countries, 5.3 billion of assets under management. Was that good timing or bad timing? Uh, I, I think it's very good timing. Um, uh, slightly unfortunate that uh, the crisis hit us so soon, but uh, the vision is to grow um, a large operating platform in Europe alongside uh, investment partners uh, like Starwood Capital and others, um, and <clears throat> Interestingly, I think the pandemic will create uh, opportunities once um, trading resumes and uh, the winners and losers emerge. I think uh, you know there's always room for innovation, and uh, we're looking forward to getting back to work and back to growth. How much of your network is actually operating at the moment, Frank? Um, we're basically 80% closed in terms of um, hotels that have had to be closed either by government edict or that can't be economically operated. Um, but we have hotels in Europe that are within a couple of weeks of reopening. We have hotels that never closed. Uh, and I think the UK is going to be uh, at the end of the line uh, yeah. with uh, maybe early July. It looks it looks as anything from the 4th of July, um, depending upon how well we do up until that time. So what I want to do, first of all, is get a feel for what you guys have been doing in the last few weeks while you've been locked down, uh, running your businesses, and what sort of measures you've taken uh, in order to maximize cash flow and reduce the cash burn. So let's go to Cody first of all. Um, how have you approached this challenge? Sure, I think probably uh, I'm a good example of how uh, the larger private equity groups uh, out there are, are navigating this this situation. Um, you know, a lot of the asset management uh, initiatives are quite similar to other hotel owners in terms of the the global reset uh, or waiver of loan covenants, um, the detailed analysis of of cash burn and uh, trying our best to take care of the people uh, within our companies and our assets, particularly tapping into any government programs that are available. Um, I think on the asset management side, what is probably interesting about this downturn versus maybe uh, 07 and 08 is as Anders alluded to, a number of the larger players are fairly well capitalized with, with healthy levels of liquidity. Um, this was, you know, one of the longest, uh, I think second longest, uh, close to the longest run that our hotel industry has had in history. Uh, and that goes for real estate, uh, the broader real estate sectors as well, um, given the low interest rate environment. 
And so private equity groups like ours that had a series of funds over that sort of 10 year period, uh, all of those funds uh, performed quite well over that time period and have uh, ample access to cash and, and other credit facilities uh, like yeah. sublines. So um, no, no major liquidity challenges right. across our legacy funds or, or our current funds, which is proving to be quite helpful. The other key point would be most private equity groups um, um, started to, um, you know, shift their capital allocations across regions or asset classes. And so from a hospitality standpoint, um, even groups like ours have uh, fairly low levels of uh, assets under management within the hospitality sector at this point. Uh, and so our exposure is, is relatively limited. Um, and so that has us uh, sitting uh, pretty good um, from, from a um, risk exposure standpoint and allows us to focus on uh, opportunities that would emerge out of this crisis um, with the, the current focus being uh, more on the public equities and corporate bonds, distressed debt, and uh, some new business lines uh, focused on special situations um, and um, um, lending. Great. You told me this is going to mean a lot of debt restructuring and resetting of relationships. Have you started on that journey yet? So I think it's actually quiet right now from a transaction calm before the storm, uh, because right. what you have right now is, is is owners are not on the phone right now trying to, to sell their assets that are on their phone right now talking to their lenders about interest deferrals, uh, waivers of covenants, uh, monitoring their cash burn, watching the news every day. If it's a lease structure, they're obviously talking to the tenant uh, on that front. Uh, and so I still think you're a ways off. I, I don't have the exact you know, point in time, but I would suspect that 2021 is going to be a very busy year uh, of a lot of activity once uh, these, these various parts of all these, these deals uh, become sort of detached. Okay, good. And as uh, you're renowned for your operational expertise and competency, um, have you uh, been able to take out as much cost as you felt you could take out? Is there more to come? Now, I think we are. We have taken out what we what we should do. We 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 get our hands quite quick around our cost side. We have a. a we have a program called Respond, Restart, and Reinvent for, to, uh, to, to, uh, to structure all these questions in different boxes. And I think what you're talking about is to respond, the first thing we did. And that was five priorities. The first one, to make sure that we secure liquidity, that we had cash available. And that happened by having an, an active and close relationship with banks and business partners. We reduced cost on operations. We... We evaluate and change in our investment and 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 the program and the maintenance program and all that took down the cost side at the same time so that we secure that we had credit limited. Um, the second part of that was to um, make sure that this cost. I spoke about that before, but the second part was that that the cost and the income should be in balance so we don't have any burn rate. And the third was to be ready to act if anything happened. Uh, uh, if some of our um, business partner of, of some reason didn't fulfill its obligation, we are ready to take over. We have done that in two hotels in Copenhagen, Copenhagen City, two 200 rooms hotels located in the city center location. No guests, but we take them over and we have no start in them more operating as we do in Pandex. Right. So and then the, what, what's, happened, hmm? what's happened to brand standards? During Actually, I don't, I don't care. And <laughs> to be right. 100% honest, uh, we, we, can, on, can we, can we if, quote you on that? If, if, if the brand standards has a value, we already have in, including them. Uh, right. And if they're not, we have never including them. And I think we have a good relationship with our those 25 brands we work with or business part of that day. Mm -hmm. They have understand that we are willing to invest in their brand standard, given that they give some sort of added value out of it in terms of value for guests and 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 i think we had accept that we have different roles to playing here so no brand standards or the you know, i i would say would that be any brand standard for the future i don't think so <laughs> that's an interesting point which we can go into a bit later frank uh, do you think the brands have responded well in terms of allowing flexibility in their standards uh 
especially leading up to the reopening phase now? Yeah, all of the uh, the dialogue with the brands seems to be uh, sensibly focused on uh, not enforcing or not even policing uh, the existing brand standards and waiving certain brand standards. Uh, for example, the requirement for porterage at certain levels is not going to be enforced. Uh, of course, they're going to have to take a completely different view of food and beverage standards and follow the local government's requirements. Um, but I, I think they're being sympathetic and supportive, but there's a lot more to come. I mean, I think the brands will need to get, you know, even closer to the owners uh, to support them through this uh, because there's going to be tough times ahead. And a lot of the operators are going to face liquidity challenges uh, with the shortage of revenues. You know, it's one thing to reopen and lose less money than when you're closed, but you're still not making a profit. So there's kind of two levels of break even. It's it's less worse, and it's <laughs> that by opening you can increase your loss. Um, but, yeah. Many operators are suggesting they won't open until they get to a certain level of viability, um, or a, an understanding that the occupancy will be at least forty percent or fifty percent or whatever it takes. Um, I think they're going to be closed for a long time, Michael. I, I think what you have to do is uh, open with a view of making less loss than you're making when you're closed and then let the market come towards you because not many travelers will book a closed hotel. Yeah, not, not, no, they won't. Actually, that's good. A, a very good point. I want to know whether this has affected your uh, company's sentiment towards hotel investment and asset management. I mean, we know that Starwood, as you said, Cody, has got a, a mixed asset class investment portfolio. Could the money go elsewhere in future? Or do you think there are bargains to be had so you'll stay put uh, in the hotel sector? Um, I think um, I think there's going to be bargains to have. I think we're still quite optimistic about the sector. I think um, it is a complicated business. It requires a certain level of sophistication and experience. Um, and uh, I think the opportunity that we see is for probably great real estate that perhaps never really um, stood for much from a positioning standpoint, uh, personality or offering standpoint. Um, so if we can find those opportunities and transform them into uh, a product that really uh, resonates with, with the customer uh, I think that's going to be great from an asset standpoint. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities when the corporate uh, uh, segment in terms of um, listed companies, either uh, from take private opportunities or from liquidity needs from from asset sales and that sort of thing. So um, I think we, we're we're still very focused on on the sector. Are you going to be bailing Colony Capital out? <laughs> Yeah. No, I'm not going to comment on, on specific deals. You know, OK. Um, I presume, uh, Frank, you're going to tell me that asset management is now more important than ever before. Uh, well, I think management is uh, more important than ever before. I think asset management is designed to try and uh, safeguard the interests of the owner. But without a good manager as a partner, all the asset management in the world isn't going to change anything. So, so really, the issue is supporting management teams, whether they're standalone, uh, a white label company or brand management, uh, to chart a course through this new normal. Because one of the things we have to remember is our social responsibility. The hotel industry globally is a massive employer. And the economic multiplier effect of hotels onto the supply chain that supports them is huge. So, so we need to find a way to get back to sustaining all of that employment, even if that means moderated margins in the short term. And, and the biggest unknown to me is how we restore consumer confidence in travel. Now, some of that will be government legislation and timing based. But I think also we, we are somewhat reliant on the short memory factor to get people back to wanting to travel. I mean, the growth in travel over the last 30 years has been extraordinary, and we need that to resume. 
And th that's where our focus should be on reopening these hotels profitably and sustainably. Uh, and as the resetting of contractual terms with management companies and franchisees, um, I mean, a lot of the revenue-based uh, contracts look to me like being in need of renegotiation because whilst uh, it's very easy to open a hotel and take a revenue-based share, if the hotel is not making any money, then all you're doing is working for the brand manager. Do you see a, a change in the management contracting? The Pandox portfolio is, is leases. 85% is coming from different sort of leases. All of them is, is based on turnover and most of them has a minimum level. I think that's an excellent business model uh, when you have... Um, Even with margins reducing? Well, the, well, the, the margin will not be re reducing if we also change the food and beverage concept, which we do now. Mm -hmm. And I was, um, my first job, first general manager job I had, uh, which was at the beginning of the 80s. So then you understand that how old I am. Um, uh, I have 39% occupancy. So I learned to uh, work with productivity uh, in the best way, and I and I still have a uh, have focus on that. That is probably the most important uh, 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 factor for for value growth. It's not about branding, and it's not about investment. It's about how much money do you get out from 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 the revenue side, and there where we are today. And if you look at the Scandinavian model, we. Um, we are a, the IKEA segment, and that 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 the people we are. So when when we go go out in in Europe and and export our model, we normally buy hotels in the mid market segment who has is underperforming in terms of productivity. And when we take them up to 45, 50 percent, we we have a fantastic deal that will continue. Um, so the problem is not the model we have. The problem is how should uh, international um, premium hotel with very much uh, focus on food and beverage. How should they survive? Because so that is when you look at when when they are out for sale, you found yeah. out that they have a lot of revenues but nothing left. Well, let me ask Cody: Is there still room for luxury? Is it affordable? Well, I think one of the, the great things that's going to come out of this for the hotel industry, which is often referred to as, as somewhat of a dinosaur in terms of the speed of, of innovation, is it is going to force us to, to rethink uh, our operating model um, and to modernize our approach uh, uh, and automate our approach to, to many things. And so uh, I agree with Anders that um, I'm actually quite excited about the challenge of reopening these hotels at much lower occupancy levels than historically and, and working with our managers uh, to see what sort of profit we can generate out of, out of them while sort of balancing, you know, some level of, of, of customer experience in there. Obviously food and beverage has traditionally been the biggest drain on, on, on blended profit margins. And so that's a big target area. Um, but so is, is labor costs, which are typically 50% of your entire cost based in a hotel. Uh, and so rethinking our approach to housekeeping to where perhaps they produce a cleaner, more sanitized room, but without sort of the excess time spent on, on you know, the frills or, or the check-in process. Um, and, and working with our brands and rethinking all the brand standards. Um, so, you know, I think that's that's a, a great opportunity for our, our, our industry to... What about the, I mean, with the, uh, <clears throat> the lack of international travel, or certainly going to take some time to get back up and running, and the claim by brands on their distribution to take international travellers to loads of destinations. So we're going local. Um, does that mean that the brand itself is not as valuable as it was in the old model? Frank? Um, well, I think, um, interestingly, this may all play into the hands of the global brands in the sense that I think they have an opportunity to differentiate themselves from a sanitation, health and hygiene perspective. And I think travellers who are nervous 
may well flock towards those that they know to be offering the highest standards. And so franchisees who adopt the measures being put out by everybody, but, you know, notably Hilton with uh, Lysol and the Mace Clinic and Accor with their protocols that they've launched and IHG and um, uh, Marriott, they're, they're all doing a lot of work there. There is definitely cost to the owner in these new sanitation uh, requirements, but I think that's a necessary requirement to get confidence back into the traveler. Okay. I mean, there is a vulnerability as well, of course, uh, in terms of reputational risk, because you just need one outbreak in one hotel group, and uh, then you've got an issue the other way. I agree with you that I think the hotels could probably cope better with the new uh, security arrangements and the safety arrangements and the cleanliness and the social distancing that's necessary, but it's got to be good. Otherwise, if it fails, it could bring down a whole circuit of them quite quickly. Let's just understand what you think are the key opportunities post the pandemic. Um, Anders, I mean, uh, Pandox has been running very fast up until the uh, beginning of this year. I'm sure you've got the appetite to continue to run even faster. Uh, where do you see uh, the opportunities and do you see the funding being out there for those opportunities? Well, you know, uh, well, Michael, we had a kickoff in January when I said I don't like the pattern in the hotel world. I saw a lot of uh, what, if I may say, intelligent capital starting coming into hotel business. A lot of investors cross every all our markets. Normally, people don't invest in hotels, start to invest, creating a lot of new capacity, yield press, a lot of capital from banks. I just saw a crash that this will not uh, be good in, in the long run. I was really uh, afraid of that, that our model to be very active in do many things will, will, will not work anymore because we need to take a more passive approach and, and start maybe not to buy any info anymore or, or whatever we should do. And then this came. All auto capital has left. Banks are much more restricted. Industrial knowledge is, is more worth than ever. Well, it, it's, it's more important than ever. It's super exciting. You, as, as Cody said, I will be a very busy to. 2021 with all these guys who step into this market for two years ago they are now running from from the business and try to escape they will never come back they were there 2010 they were that beginning of the 90s they were there just after 9 11 and they came back 2007 all always too late now they're running away and we will continue to pick up good deals. We will use our knowledge of be one of the few companies in the industry to be active in the full yeah. value chain. And I will be at least be CEO of Pandox for the next 50 years. So great, it's a great, it's a great, um, great future. And you might even get a photograph on your back wall, but hopefully you won't look like the other four dogs. There. Well, we have four <laughs> corporate dogs, and we have them on picture here, of course. Do you don't yeah. have that sound, three dogs that, on the pictures? Your remarks were very much like a terrier, I feel. Yeah. <laughs> Frank, you said you were already seeing acquisition opportunities when we spoke about this earlier in the week. Uh, where are you seeing those, and what sort are they? Uh, all over the place. I think the first wave is likely to be from lease structures that are under strain because, of course, uh, if the income goes to zero, uh, the tenant has uh, a, a great difficulty in servicing the rent. And even if there's a degree of forgiveness, uh, if that tenant has other capital obligations, you know, often tenants of leased hotels are also developers. Um, they can quickly run out of cash. So I think you have to decide which part of that puzzle you're going to go after, whether it's the landlords or the tenants in distress. And then I think the more traditional freehold owner, borrower situation is not really going to come into focus until later in the year, possibly next year, uh, where the bank's forbearance uh, comes to an end. Uh, there are many poorly capitalized, weak balance sheet uh, companies and operators out there 
who are going to need a solution. And, you know, we tend to co-invest alongside our capital partners, but the capital partners, as Cody indicated, are sitting with lots of dry powder because they are generally not over-invested in the sector and like the sector. Uh, so I think there's going to be no shortage of investors. It's going to be picking the right deals. And the challenge is actually, how do you underwrite well when the short term is so uncertain? Uh, and I think it, it's the guys that can look four to five years out uh, and kind of weather the slope of the curve, whether it's steep or shallow, uh, who will be the guys doing the deal. Cody, how are you going to convince uh, your colleagues to put their money into hotels rather than into the other asset classes that they invest in? Well, there is going to be a wave of distress that's going to hit the industry. And uh, when you're coming in uh, at sort of early on in the cycle, when you don't have much visibility, as Frank mentioned, uh, it really is all about your basis. You have to have a lot of conviction in your basis because you can't, it's, it's tough to have conviction on what's going to happen to red pars over the next you know year or two. But if you've got great real estate, in three, four, five years' time, then that could produce uh, acceptable returns. Um, I think what we're going to see happen in Europe specifically, if you can, you know, 07 and 08 uh, was all about the great deleveraging uh, by the banks of all the over levered deals that they financed and ended up on their balance sheets or distressed owners. Uh, I, I would refer to this one in Europe as the great restructuring of all the uh, over overly structured deals uh, that have occurred in the last uh, few years, uh, often by the more passive investors um, and uh, uh, somewhat of the ones that Anders described so eloquently. Um, Anders sits in a different bucket, by the way, because he's highly unique in that he puts these deal structures in place because it's great from a, a uh, uh, investment uh, risk perspective for his shareholders, but he has the in-house capability to take these over as well as uh, retains that right within his contracts. Uh, so he's very different than some of the more um, highly structured, less sophisticated um, buyers that have been um, accounting for a, a, a large uh, percentage of, of deals in the last three to four years. So is that a, a, that's a polite way of saying to Anders, he's astute, I think. Uh, I think there are two more uh, uh, descriptions you can put Anders in your um, line of uh, activity. One is uh, unwind and the other is rewind, uh, which I think the hotel industry does seem to do every decade or so. Right, guys, uh, we're coming to the end of our 45 minutes, a journey of discovery under Follow the Sun from China to India to the Gulf. And now we're here in Europe. My final question is the impact on global travel. Do you think the sun is setting or rising on the global hotel industry? I think most of you think it's rising. And how long is it going to take to recover back to 2019 levels of occupancy and rate? So let's start with uh, Frank. Uh, can you give me your weather forecast? Have you got a sunny outlook? <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's very difficult to answer that question globally because some areas will come back more quickly, others will lag. I, I think as a generalization, I would be surprised if we're back to 2019 levels of uh, both revenue and profit before 2023. I think that would be quite aspirational. I think the next two years, being 21 and 22, are going to be years of recovery. That's not to say some markets may not have bounced fully back in 22, but I think there will be some that take even longer than I'm indicating. Uh, and I'm most worried about, um, in the short term, the gateway cities, because I, I think that that may not be as easy to get the bounce back because of the density of population. But, right. you know, a two to three year process. OK. And Cody, uh, stormy weather ahead. Do you think we can get there before 2023? <laughs> uh, it, it's going to be a rough year or two, but I think the math is on our side from a sector perspective, because when you look at what's fueled international uh, global travel over the last 30 plus years, uh, the size of the pie keeps uh, growing, keeps increasing from global population growth to the rising middle class 
to the baby bo- baby boomers in top feeder markets like the U.S. Um, and so we've got uh, a lot of positive uh, uh, wind in our sails from a demand standpoint. And the and the real uh, boost we're going to get is very similar to what we saw in prior crashes, is uh, the drying up of financing for new construction and new supply. Um, and we've had a lot of supply uh, oversaturating a number of cities in Europe, particularly in UK and Germany. And so if we can get what we got early on in the last cycle of a number of years of one or less than 1% supply growth in a lot of these markets, by the time we hit 2023 or whenever the year our demand returns to prior levels, we will have benefited from uh, reduced supply and a very limited uh, supply pipeline going forward. So I think that bodes well, particularly in a low interest rate environment where the ECB Let's just announce a three billion euro targeted vehicle to lend at uh, uh, up to minus one percent interest uh, to all the European banks. So, real estate, cash flowing real estate continues to look as 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 the best. Right, and that does well. It's Sweden cold swell, cold spells followed by a heat wave. But well, uh, let me also this way. I, I I agree about the the global uh, travelers that they will that will take some time, and they but they will come, definitely come back. You see the middle class is growing, as Cody said. And other. But the most important demand will come in quicker, and that is the domestic demand. And yeah. always in every market, except of maybe Brussels in Europe, hotels are filling up by domestic people. Eight of ten people in Germany is are German. Uh, I would think seven and a half of people in the UK who stay in hotels from the UK. Nine of ten in, is from France. It's from France and seven and a half of 10 in Scandinavian is those different Scandinavian countries. So we have the most important segment there. And of this, in, in, in that domestic segment, the, um, the winner will be the mid-market hotels, of course, because that's how it will be in short term. And we need those international travelers to get up in rate, perhaps. But I, 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 I'm quite optimistic that okay. the domestic reaction will be quite strong, that people will start to traveling. We see this first green shot already here now, end of the summer. And at the end of the year, we will reach 40-50% occupancy across Europe. All everything about domestic travelers and that is so important to know that that domestic segment is the most important segment and has always been in the industry and that also put the brand global brands in the regional brands are also very important good well thank you anders on that optimistic note of 50 percent occupancy and no brand standards i'm going to have to bring this discussion uh, to a close um I'm delighted uh, that my guests indeed will weather the storms and there's no doubt stick around for some sunnier days to come. I want to thank you all for joining in this discussion. I wish you well as you continue uh, 